Hey everyone, welcome back to this channel. If this is the, your first time joining me, make sure to click that subscribe button and like this video if you like what you're listening to today. And I hope you find this interview helpful because I'm here with a very special guest, Bob Miller. And I wanted to bring him along because the test that I really started to love using with my patients is the functional genomic analysis, um, Tree of Life. And why I like this is because it's really helped us tie in the why, because so many of you want to know why this is happening to me. We, we know it's happening, but we want to know why. And it seems like nobody can give you the answer. And I'm finding that this really is tying all of that together. So stay tuned because I don't want you to miss this interview. I'm here with Bob Miller to dive into some very important co concepts when it comes to bladder pain and IC, which include histamines, oxalates, and how they relate to inflammation and detox pathways. Bob Miller has been doing some amazing work with his company, Nutrigenetic Research, and dives into pathways and genomics of mechanisms that we see in clinical practice. Now, he's a traditionally trained naturopath specializing in the field of genetic-specific nutrition, and he received his degree at the Trinity School of Natural Health and is board certified through the ANMA. And in 1993, he opened his Tree of Life practice and served as a traditional naturopath for 27 years. In the past decade, he's really focused on genetic research. To learn more about him, check his website, Tree of Life Health, and for research and education, it's NutrigeneticResearch.org. Um, is there any other websites that I need to mention? No, that'll do it. All right, great. So let's dive in. For those of you who are new, I want to talk about interstitial cystitis because I have this and it is a horrible diagnosis to receive. I still to this day remember this diagnosis when I was 31 years old. I just had my first child and I'm being told by my gynecologist that this is something you're going to have to live with for the rest of your life. It was not what I wanted to hear. It was like a death sentence. So the symptoms of interstitial cystitis, often called bladder pain syndrome, include things such as urgency, frequency, painful urination, pelvic pain, painful intercourse, and vulvodynia. Now, when I was first diagnosed, I had no idea what was going on, and the only thing they could offer me was medications and surgery. But over the last few years, over the last five years primarily, you know, we really have honed in and findings have actually identified that IC is related to oxalates, mast cells, and histamines. And I've actually seen this myself with my own healing, but also in clinical practice with my patients. And also some of the tests that I've run, I can see them, we can measure some of these things on labs. So these triggers are definitely included in the pathology of this condition. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. Um, I'm also finding mold to be a very big problem with this population. I too have mold colonization in my gut and I also have mycotoxin um, burden. So we see this as well and it's very rampant and there's a strong association that we can also touch on as well today. So I wanna dive into some of these pathways and I'm gonna pass this over to Bob now who can start to help us navigate and start having some of these conversations. Okay, Dr. Manny, a pleasure to be with you. And I think people are going to be quite fascinated tonight because we're not just going to talk about what histamine is or oxalates are. Uh, most people know that. We want to look at the pathways, how they create the problems. And I think we're going to be presenting some fascinating information that uh, probably hasn't been uh, heard before. So let me start with the screen share here. And see the screen there okay? Yes, sir. Okay, well, so here we go. So we're going to be talking about oxalates, mold, histamine, mast cells, and I'm actually going to throw in there just a little bit of Lyme, because I believe what happens is that we've, they all have a common pathway for inflammation. Now, I first want to start out by talking about something that probably no one's heard about, and that's called RANTES, strange name, regulated upon activation, normal T cells expressed and secreted. It's a powerful pro-inflammatory mediator of the cytokine family. What it does, it regulates the mobilization and survival of immune inflammatory cells from the bloodstream, puts it into tissues. Now, can that be a good thing? Sure, it's one of the ways the body protects itself. However, one of the things we're finding is there's so many environmental factors combined with genetic factors that causes many of these processes to be overexpressed. And here you see in this study that sustained production is associated with several detrimental effects. And taking the uh, rantes down, that uh, is often associated with improved outcomes. Now, rantes is produced by 
platelets, macrophages, epithelial cells. And look at this, it stimulates histamine secretion mm. by mast cells. So that's why we're pulling this in. Rantes recruits T cells, macrophages, eosinophils, and basophils to sites of inflammation. So this is part of our new research. And actually some folks that are doing research on long haul COVID are finding that the Rantes is high. And we're also finding in the folks with uh, chronic Lyme disease, this is high. It'd be fascinating sometime to see if this might be a, something that's happening in the, the folks dealing with, uh, with IC. Now, let's not uh, be too uh, overwhelmed by this. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're interested in this map, uh, you can just go to neutrogenicresearch.org slash research, and you can download it. We don't ask for an email. There's no charge. You know, no gimmicks here. You won't get on our email list or anything like that. But what I want to show you here uh, is why uh, we might be having so many difficulties with uh, with the uh, with all of these conditions. And I'm just looking here for my. There we go. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom up here <clears throat> to uh, to right up here, and you will see it says TNFA. Now this is an enzyme, t tumor necrosis factor alpha. And it's one of our friends, unless it's not. So what it does when, when we're faced with a pathogen or something that we need to get rid of, tumor necrosis factor kicks in. It stimulates something called NF kappa B, which again is inflammatory. It stimulates something called NADPH oxidase, which is inflammatory stimulates interleukin-6, that's a cytokine, that's people I'm sure have heard of the cytokine storm. Then here we go, we stimulate mast cells. But before I go there, I wanna show there's an enzyme called heme oxygenase one that calms down nf kappa B. Heme oxygenase one calms down an ADPH oxidase and it calms down interleukin-6. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about this later, it's controlled by NERF-2 which is held back or weakened by something called KEEP1. And we're gonna show how what we're finding is that those who are really struggling may have this KEEP1 upregulated, meaning that it's overactive, inhibiting NERF2. NERF2 is not able to stimulate heme oxygenase. Heme oxygenase is not able to put the brakes on. Very common pattern that we've just, uh, that we've just found. So then we get the mast cells, we'll talk about those. Then we get the histamine. And then this is something somewhat new. Uh, there's an enzyme called INOS, inducible nitric oxide synthase. Now people have probably heard of nitric oxide. It is a gas that dilates the blood vessels. The study of it won a research award in 1998 with, uh, with, uh, with major research winnings. And the ENOS enzyme, is what dilates the blood vessels. Then there's one called INOS, inducible nitric oxide. And INOS is what's responsible for killing pathogens. So again, when we have some pathogen, a virus, bacteria, or something else, INOS kicks in to kill it by creating a lot of nitric oxide. Can that be a good thing, Mandy? You mm -hmm. betcha, unless it's overactive. Mm -hmm. Histamine will stimulate this, and we'll show later there's actually genetic mutations that will cause this to be overactive. So the reason this won the Nobel Prize in 1998 was because this is so important for circulation, but if INOS is running too fast, it inhibits the ENOS. Now, the next thing is that there's something called BH4 that's needed to make this happen. And when this is running too fast and too hard, we run out of BH4, we're running off BH2 instead. And rather than making this important nitric oxide, we make a nasty free radical called superoxide, which is likely involved in some of the pathology here of what you're talking about. That superoxide then combines with nitric oxide to make peroxin nitrite. All right, then this thing continues and the INOS stimulates platelets which will stimulate the Rantes. So the reason I brought the Rantes in here is because the Rantes will stimulate mast cells, which then stimulates histamine, 
which stimulates Rantes. Uh, cycle. And what we got here, Mandy, is a merry-go-round here. It just feeds upon itself. You know, and now that I think about it, I do think I have seen several people who've had elevated platelets on blood chemistry. That's something we can measure, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, the next thing that happens is when this tuber necrosis factor is upregulated. And as you mentioned, mycotoxins, clostridia, Lyme disease, uh, they will all stimulate this tuber necrosis factor. And that will cause the body to bring what's called arachidonic acid out of the cell membrane. And arachidonic acid is one of the, the fats. And that will come down a pathway, stimulating something called thromboxane A2, stimulating the platelets to once again make more ranties. Now, we all know the importance of the fish oils, the omega-3s. There's actually genetic mutations that can inhibit your body's ability to take omega-3s and turn them into something called protectins and resolvins that calms down the platelets. So if you are having a diet high in omega-6s and not enough omega-3s, or you have genetic issues, this process doesn't work. And we get the ranties, we get the mast cells in the histamine. I will say about that fish oil, because when we run the NutraVal, we do see that they might have enough of the substrate, but they're not converting properly because even those fads rely on nutrient cofactors. And sometimes they're low in the cofactors too. So we'll see that conversion not happening as well. Absolutely. So there is the big picture. Now that may seem a little overwhelming. Now I'm going to get into detail, but just wanted to show everybody the big picture of what I think is happening. Now, here is a uh, just an expanded version of that. Oxalates in electromagnetic fields will stimulate the NOx enzyme, NADPH oxidase, which then stimulates interleukin-6. So here again, we we're showing the same map that we showed before, but just a little more detail now. There are some individuals, particularly of English and Irish background or Ashkenazi Jewish background, they have a genetic mutation in the enzyme called HFE, that can cause them to absorb more iron. Mm. What does that do? That stimulates tumor necrosis factor and NF kappa B. And as we spoke about earlier, heme oxygenase is a very important enzyme. What I'm finding, Dr. Mandy, is that many of the individuals who are really struggling have genetic weakness on heme oxygenase 1, genetic weakness on NERF 2, and genes that will actually cause keep one to be stronger, which suppresses NERF2. That's a hard concept to grasp. But that's can, can you explain to my audience about NERF2? Because it's so important. I don't want to neglect that. Tell them what, what, what is NERF2 and why is it important? Yeah, NERF2 stands for Nuclear Transaction Factor Enthroid 2. And it's held back by keep one. Actually, keep one kind of like degrades it. When the body senses inflammation, keep one stops degrading. And NERF2 isn't just heme oxygenase. NERF2 controls all the genes that make the master antioxidant glutathione. Yep. They're involved with phase one, two, and three metabolism. They're involved with the lipid metabolism, glucose, making something called NADPH. It controls the cleaning of the cells called autophagy. That's why- It's a superstar. It's a superstar. I always tell people NERF2 is a superstar. Absolutely. When they've looked at uh, various animals, like bats and rats, um, the uh, the bats have about twice the nerve two as the rats, and they live about twice as long. Mm. So when you look at chimpanzees versus humans, there does seem to be a relationship between nerve two and longevity. Because you said it's a, I like that phrase, superstar. I'm going to use superstar. that. <laughs> That's why we and, love our broccoli sprouts, because <laughs> it helps <laughs> upregulate nerve two. Absolutely. And, and it does so by slowing down keep one. I just learned that uh, recently. Oh, broccoli sprouts slows down keep one. Uh huh. Yeah. Nice. So keep one inhibits nerf two. Yeah. So what we're finding is that many people who are struggling, that they just can't, you know, they're going from one clinic to another inflamed, they actually inherit a mutation from both parents that is a gain of function on keep one. So keep an eye out for that when you talk to some of your folks. I like and, that. Keep an eye out for keep one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then that, uh, and then particularly, what we're finding is if somebody has this upregulated, they may have the HFE upregulated. Mm -hmm. You can also get gain of function mutations on TNF alpha. 
So there are some individuals that they have a genetic issue that this is overactive. Then I want to talk a little bit about CERT1. Mm. This is probably one of my top five SNPs that I believe are very important. There's just one of them, but a mutation in it can weaken CERT1. And CERT1 also inhibits NF-kappa-B and NADPH oxidase. So the patterns we're seeing is obviously not all of these, but if you've got gain of function on TNF, lack of function on CERT1, or you've got overabsorption of iron, not enough heme oxygenase, or there's actually genetic variants that'll upregulate interleukin-6. So, or if there's uh, oxalates, we'll talk about it a little bit. Um, the jury is out, but it's becoming more and more obvious that electromagnetic fields from our cell phones, which we just adore, but too much of them will actually stimulate the NADPH oxidase. Oh, boy. Then, as we discussed, mast cells, so we'll talk about them a little bit, histamine, and we'll also talk about how some people overproduce histamine, but some people do not have the ability to degrade histamine. That's important, I will have to say, because a lot of times people are taking DAO thinking that's all they need. And I try to tell them it might not be your thing. You might have something else going on with the histamine that may not be DAO deficiency. Absolutely. We're going to talk about uh, histidine decarboxylase, which can be upregulated. So here is, uh, this comes from functional genomic nutrition. And these are the SNPs that when they're, when they're mutated, and what we mean by this is that I'm sure people have seen DNA that looks like a ladder that twists. Mm -hmm. On the one side, you get nucleotide from mother. On the other side, nucleotide from father. And you can get what's called a SNP, single nucleotide polymorphism or genetic defect. I don't like the word defect, but what it does then is that, uh, that, uh, that gene has not the optimal way to produce enzymes. And let's just talk about that a little bit. What a miracle we are, Dr. Randy. We eat fats, yeah. carbohydrates, proteins. We drink water, breathe air, and we're exposed to sunlight and everything gets made. I mean, just really astonishing. Every time I say it, I think about how astonishing that is, that thousands of times per second, something is going on and uh, making something inside our body. When we have genetic mutations or SNPs, it may be overactive or underactive. Right here, this TNF, and there's the RS number. If somebody wants to, you know, if they have like an old 23Me or something, a one right here means that the TNF is overactive. So when it's faced by mycotoxins, lipopolysaccharides, it's going to over respond. This is a very important CERT1. When someone has this one, their CERT1 is lower. And remember, that holds things back. Interleukin 6, these are gain of function mutations. So this makes it run faster. And here's the keep one. And what's interesting, there's a keep one that is a gain of function, and there's a keep one that's a lack of function. Oh, really? Yeah. So when you've got this up one, that means the keep one is stronger. Uh -huh. And what we've been finding when this is a two from both parents, this is when people are really struggling. Mm -hmm. Nerf two, there's mutations in that that'll make nerve two less than optimal. Overabsorption of iron. Genetic mutations here, very common among English, Irish, Ashkenazi, Jewish, some Germans, they overabsorb iron and stimulate. Heme oxygenase one that we showed earlier, mutations here will weaken that. So by this quick snapshot here and looking at that in the software, you can get an idea how that uh, pathway might be going. Now, as we talked about, we make these uh, these mast cells, and I'm only I only have one slide here on on mast cells. So mast cells are white blood cells that are, in, in simple terms, they're like the army of the body. They're floating around. And when there's a problem, they kick in to help us. Is that a good thing? Yep. Unless it's overactive, Dr. Mandy. And that's what we're seeing. You know, when I, when I talk to doctors who have been practicing more than 20 years, I'll say, how much mast cell activation did you see 20 years ago? And it's like, we didn't. How much are you seeing now? It's like, oh my gosh, one out of four. So something environmentally is causing us to have these mast cells over respond. Mm -hmm. They create histamine, interleukin-4, interleukin-13, inflammatory. They actually even stimulate tumor necrosis factor alpha and uh, they increase vascular permeability, stimulate mucus secretion. Uh, they're the army, they're in there to kill. Is that a good thing? 
sure, unless it's overactive. And we now have so many things that's causing our mast cells to be overactive. So here you can see that uh, mast cells become overreactive and overrelease inflammatory mediators, possibly nine to 14% of the population. Uh, now the, the folks who go to functional doctors and have got lots of inflammation, it's, it's very common, it might be 25 to 30%. There's actually uh, enzymes called KIT, K-I-T, that are gain of function. Mutation in these KIT genes cause the mast cells to overreact. Uh -huh. Now, you don't have to have those to have mast cells overacting. If this is pushing too hard, it'll overreact as well. Got it. And here are the KIT genes. Now, there's none on here. And you can see this, this number over here shows how common what we're seeing is. So this is no mutations. And 97.4% of the time, there's no mutations. 99.5%. Now, 100% means there's never, but it's like less than 40 out of 50,000. So when people have mutations here, they often have uh, mast cells over firing. It's so, rare. Is it a, it's more rare. Would that be more associated with the mast cell cytosis, the uh, more yes. severe presentation of mast cells? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Gotcha. I don't see these very often. Yeah, because mast cell cytosis is pretty rare too. Are, yeah. But again, environmental factors uh, can... Uh, you know, if we've got this NOx enzyme because we've got mycotoxins or, or Lyme disease or lipopolysaccharides and it's pushing too hard, you can still have excess mast cells despite not having the gain of function. Now, I just throw that, this in. That, that's an important thing for people to grasp. You don't have to have a mutation slash variation. I don't like the word mutation. A variation, polymorphism, in order to have the problem because environmental can actually trump that. Absolutely. Uh, I just threw this in that uh, I'm, I'm giving a talk soon on mental health, mast cell activation, an underappreciated cause of psychiatric symptoms, uh, an alert to psychiatrists, depression, anxiety, brain fog, uh, anxiety-like behavior, all of that can come from mast cells being uh, overactivated. So that's why so many people that are dealing with this, they also have an emotional component as well. I was in a um, talk where they were talking about histamine and I about to talk about that in um, suicidal behavior and mm -hmm. bipolar. Absolutely, yeah. Now, here's a slide we have on histamine. The role of brain histamine in acute and chronic stresses. Brain histamine has a variety of psychological roles in brain function. Regulates the anterior pituitary hormones. Uh, some anxiolytic drugs decrease brain histamine turnover. That's how they work. Uh, and and uh, there's four receptor sites for histamine. And some receptor sites uh, decrease anxiety, uh, receptor site uh, uh, agonists. Um, now, the uh, histamine could play a key role in depression, according to study in mice. So a lot of these folks who not only are not feeling well, they're, uh, they're also depressed or anxious. And my four famous words are, it's not your fault. Yeah. Uh, because so many individuals, you know, get told, well, just buck up, you know, and just meditate harder or pray harder or do something else. But when you've got these mast cells firing, it's not your fault. It's going to be, uh, it's going to be difficult. Um, now that's your level of expertise, the IC. Do you also find anxiety as a, is a Oh yeah. Brain fog, anxiety, myself included. I used to have panic attacks. Now I think I attribute that to the histamine whenever I have panic attacks, because it did correlate to my histamine flares. Mm-hmm. So Absolutely. yeah, panic attacks, anxiety, brain fog is a common, common complaint. Absolutely. Now let's look at how we degrade histamine. Oh yeah, this is the good stuff. So uh, histamine is not bad. We need it for a lot of processes. It's not the enemy. But when it's in excess, we have a problem. So look what we do. We take progesterone, turn it into cortisol that calms down the histamine. Mm. Can we be low in progesterone? Definitely. Sure. There's a hormonal imbalance rampant amongst ICRs. Mm -hmm. Then there's this enzyme CYP21A2 that turns your progesterone into your cortisol. Now, a good way to know if, if this is not doing well is, of course, you know, you can do some cortisol testing. But if you get dizzy when you stand up quickly, called POTS, oh. you know, that can be a sign of adrenal fatigue that you're having a hard time making the histamine or making the cortisol to knock down the histamine. I'll tell you that cortisol, low cortisol is also very, very common amongst when we do like Dutch testing, many of them are very, very tanked in their cortisol levels. 
Sure, because their their adrenals are just tuckered out, trying their darndest to take care of this histamine. And I'll show you later. It also his, uh, cortisol is needed to uh, calm down something called uh, phospholipase A2 that we'll get to in a little bit. Now, you er, mentioned earlier that there's the enzyme DAO. You can have genetic mutations on the ABP1 enzyme that lowers your body's ability to make histamine. I'm sorry, make the, the DAO enzyme rather that degrades histamine. Now, I'm not opposed to uh, fermented foods, but there's some people who just get on their soapbox and say, eat histamine or eat fermented foods for your gut. Are they correct? Absolutely. But if you already have too much histamine and you don't have enough DAO, purposely eating a lot of more fermented foods can actually be detrimental. Oh, kombucha used to kill me. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, sure. Now, there's an interesting enzyme called HNMT, histamine and methyltransferase, that needs something called SAMI to degrade histamine. You can have mutations here. Or you can have perfect HNMT, and if because of methylation issues, you don't have enough SAMI. Mm -hmm. It's like having a brand new car without gas. MAOA also degrades histamine. Controlled by CERT, and we also need FAD, which comes from riboflavin. So here again, even a riboflavin deficiency could mess up your ability to clear, even if this enzyme is, is perfect. Riboflavin is commonly synthesized, um, very much synthesized by gut bacteria. So a lot of times when we have dysbiosis, we actually may not be producing our own endogenous synthesis of riboflavin. Absolutely. It's also and very easily damaged in food processing. It's just like milk, uh, just how it's heated or it, where it's stored can actually destroy the riboflavin. Absolutely. Now, here is UGT1A4. This is a process called glucuronidation. Mm. And you can have some mutations here, the UGT1A4s, that you don't clear histamine through glucuronidation. And then here's a really tricky one. Histidine is an amino acid, you know, high in things like uh, beef and pork. The HDC enzyme, histidine decarboxylase, turns this into histamine with B6 as a cofactor. That's why some people, you know, think, okay, I'm going to improve my health. I'm going to take a B complex. There's lots of B6 in it, and they feel worse if this is upregulated. So uh, many times I've seen people do better by just stopping their B complex. Now, I'm not telling anybody not to take their B complex. I'm just saying if this guy is upregulated and there's signals coming to make it and you're eating a lot of beef, B6 can actually increase the, uh, the histamine. I have a lot to say about that. I had a flare, a really bad flare when a medical doctor one time told me to take high dose B6 and it sent me into the hospital. That's my story. But this is very interesting finding. I've been very interested in this pathway for a couple of things. I do iodine testing and I'm finding out that about 90% of the folks that I work with are low in iodine which by itself, it has so many physiological processes I can't even begin to describe, but that's a big finding there. And many are trying this carnivore diet because of the oxalates. And so they might be driving up their histidines and, and then, then they try to take the B6 because they're being told that B6 is involved in oxalate degradation, you know, like some of those oxalate snips, and they're finding out that they're feeling worse afterwards. And they're like, how's that even possible? I'm, I'm doing a low oxalate carnivore diet and I'm trying to explain to them, well, <laughs> this is why. It's the 3D chess game played underwater, Dr. Mandy. Yeah. And I'm glad you brought that up because iodine, testosterone, and ECGC inhibit histidine decarboxylase. Mm -hmm. So if you're low in iodine or testosterone and what's happening to testosterone levels they're tanking mm -hmm. uh, so we uh, we don't hold this back and that's why i like to use a product called uh, dao support that has dao in it plus a little bit of iodine and ecgc and black human seed oil We've seen um, everybody skin. listening do you guys know what ecgc is and what am i want to tell them it's found in green tea absolutely yeah and you can get it in a supplement without the caffeine because sometimes yep. people say, i can't do that because of the caffeine you can get that without the uh, the caffeine. And the matcha tea is high oxalate too. Yes. So here's the SNPs, the ABP1, the MAOB, UGT, CYP21A2, and the histidine to histamine conversion. Now, here's a chart of what you can look at when you get your genetic test. And for those of you listening, uh, Dr. Mandy does this test for you. And what she can look at here is the ABP1s. And these are the ones that will make the DAO. Here's histamine and methyltransferase. 
And you can see this two here only occurs in 4.1% of the population for this individual. Then here's the MAOA. And this is somebody who is having a huge histamine problem. So you can see they're not making enough DAO. Their HNMT is not working as well. The MAOA is not working as well. They've got problems with MAOB and also UGT. Uh, this individual did not have an HDC, but uh, that would just be icing on the cake. But this would be someone having a hard time degrading histamine. This is not so the they, same MAO and dopamine, is it? Yes. Uh -huh. Oh, this is. Okay. Yeah, so okay. they would also have some uh, issues with low dopamine as well, the symptom wise? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Now, the uh, the histamine, if, uh, if anyone really wants to do a deep dive into histamine, um, I do interviews with uh, Dr. Jill Carnahan. And if you just go to her YouTube channel, we speak for 45 minutes just on histamine. So there's the uh, the long version if you find this interesting because we're just touching the surface here today. I've watched that one twice. Wow. Okay. Good. That was a really informative. Really informative. Oh, good. Glad you liked it. Yeah. Now let's talk about nitric oxide. Remember we spoke earlier, Nobel Prize, 1998, uh, for the, uh, the the study on endothelial nitric oxide. As we said, when we are faced with a pathogen, bacteria, virus, fungus, or parasite, INOS kicks in, makes a lot of nitric oxide. Now, again, back to environmental factors. INOS is upregulated by aluminum, mercury, mm -hmm. uranium, BPA, that's our plastics. By the way, I think plastics is one of the big things we have to worry about. Uh, ethanol, electromagnetic fields, High fructose corn syrup, which only came about in the mid to late 70s, uh, gluten, chlorine fluoride, Roundup, your glyphosate, high homocysteine and iron overload, all stimulate this INOS enzyme. You can also have genetic mutations that'll cause INOS to be overactive. And as we said earlier, when this is overactive, we use up the BH4, and the BH2, rather than making nitric oxide, makes superoxide free radical. And I've not seen any literature that that's involved with IC, but I wouldn't be surprised it is, the superoxide. Suppressing your endothelial nitric oxide, and in addition to uh, uh, the inflammation, this is what sets you up for clots, for cardiovascular disease, mm -hmm. if we don't have enough of the endothelial nitric oxide. Now, we won't spend a lot of time on this, but BH4 not only plays a role in INOS, it's necessary for phenylalanine to tyrosine. So what are we doing? We're making diet sodas and, and aspartame for our coffee. It takes the uh, tyrosine into L-DOPA. If you don't do this enough, uh, you're going to get tremors and eventually Parkinson's. You need BH4 to take your tryptophan into 5-HTP and then serotonin and melatonin. So if this phenylalanine is not converting, anxious, uh, if the tyrosine doesn't turn into dopa, low dopamine, tremors, and then you're going to be depressed and can't sleep. So BH4 is a really important molecule. And you can also have genetic issues that you don't make enough BH4. You can also have trouble recycling BH4. And uh, if INOS is upregulated and you don't have enough BH4, you're just one inflammation factory making more superoxide. And uh, very, very common for this to occur. One of the things that you'll notice in these folks is cold hands and feet. Mm -hmm. Very uh, much so. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so again, if somebody wants this chart, download it for free. No email needed, no charge for it. So the cold hands and feet is the ENOS is downregulated. And yes. um, okay, so they're not getting good blood flow. Mm -hmm. That used to be me for years. It's not anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I used I'm to have sure. a heater always next to me all day long in the summer. Makes sense. Sure. Yeah. And then for uh, that, that can also lead to the, the blood clots. It can also then lead to spider veins or varicose veins. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or hemorrhoids. Okay. Yeah. I hear that a lot too. Yeah. All right, just put this slide up here to show that the INOS activation will cause the, uh, the platelet secretion to cause the, uh, the platelets to become activated. Um, and again, here's the environmental factors. 
And we're going to talk about there's actually genetic mutations that will cause this to be upregulated. And you'll notice we call it the Carnahan reaction. That's named after Jill Carnahan because uh, she's very open about this. I mean, she says it in all of her talks. She had breast cancer and Crohn's disease at a young age. And what we discovered was that she inherited from both mother and father the genetic mutations on the two SNPs that are gain of function. So we named it after her, the Carnahan reaction. And uh, if you'd like to watch that, uh, we an hour and 15 minutes just on that subject, uh, watch on INOS, where we, uh, where we give honor to Dr. Jill for finding the Carnahan reaction. And she's hoping that uh, she can be a contribution to humanity by uh, pointing that out. That's next on my list to watch. <laughs> yeah, I think you'd enjoy that. All right, so here is what happens when uh, these are the genetic mutations that will cause this to happen. You can see here, this is a gain of function and a two on it. This only occurs in 3.9% of the population. And then you can also have a down regulation of NOS3. And by the way, we, we didn't put uh, supplements in here and nutrients because that would make this way too long. But as I like to tell everybody, I have no bad news. Everything that we show here, you can compensate for. Good. So here's what will cause you to have trouble with the uh, with the BH4, the MTHFR A1298, QDPR, which is recycling, folate assimilation, and DHFR. So if you've got genetic mutations here, you may not recycle that BH2 to BH4. Then these are the genes that are responsible for making BH4. And you can see these are not very common. 99.9% .9 is good. 100% is good. So when you see SNPs here, usually these are folks that uh, trying to boost their BH4 is a large part of what's going on for them. And interestingly, royal jelly is a naturally occurring source of BH4. Oh, good. That's what they give to the queen bee. Hmm. So the difference between the worker bee and the queen bee is the queen bee gets the royal jelly. Hmm. So I like to tell people it's for when dealing with women, it's time that you get treated like the princess that you are getting the royal jelly. So. There you go. Especially All if right. you have BH4 deficiency. Exactly. <laughs> now, the uh, remember we said if we don't make nitric oxide, we're going to make superoxide. Mm -hmm. Superoxide disputase is the enzyme that will neutralize the superoxide free radical. Well, guess what? You can have mutations here as well. Uh, where I just grabbed this from someone's software, they didn't have any, but you would see a one or two here in these enzymes. And that means that they may need to take the superoxide disputase antioxidant. You asked about superoxides in IC, and I'll tell you, I have made, I have found that oxidative stress can upregulate endogenous oxalate production through mm -hmm. the gall excellent pathway. I found a few journals that confirm that. And I definitely noticed after um, I had COVID, I had more oxidative stress. Um, and I noticed my oxalate levels actually crept up, up as well. So that maybe that's the indirect connection with superoxides and True. I see. Could be. Well, as you know, COVID comes in using ACE2. And that's what creates the cytokine storm with the uh, interleukin-6 being upregulated. And then interleukin-6 stimulates superoxide, mast cells, histamine. Now, let's see if we can just blow this up a little bit here. And let's look at, uh, uh, there we go. These are all the things that can stimulate interleukin-6. Histamine, angiotensin-2, NOx, bradykinin, obesity, high homocysteine, oxalates, oxalates. C. diff, will stimulate interleukin-6, estriol, hydrogen peroxide, over-exercise, virus and anxiety, internally, Lyme, lipopolysaccharides, EMF and radon. Yeah. Uh, people need to check for their radon too. They don't think about that. Yeah. Uh, air pollution, smoking, coffee, unfortunately, too much of it. Of course, lead, mercury, aluminum, glyphosate, too many uh, omega-6s, VOCs, pesticides and anything that stimulates mTOR. All of that will stimulate interleukin-6, makes more superoxide, more mast cells, more histamine. Then it comes back in something we call the home cycle to stimulate the renin-angiotensin system. 
And interestingly, angiotensin II stimulates Rantes. Hmm. So uh, just multiple circuses going on here that can happen inside the body. And here's the SNPs that can impact uh, all of that. So we call it the, uh, the home cycle where this thing just feeds upon itself. Wow. Uh, if someone finds this interesting, here's another interview, almost two hours on this one. We really got wow. carried away on that one. Yeah. Uh, inter- episode number uh, 42. Oxalates. And Is that I, her I'm, picture of her in the background? Yeah, that's Jill. That's Dr. Jill. Oh, no, in the, in the hospital bed. No, no, I don't oh, think okay. so. Oh, okay. Okay. No. Because I knew she had cancer. I wasn't sure it was. Okay. No, I don't think so. So I think most of your folks know what oxalates are. So oh. we'll go through this quickly. <laughs> yeah, too much. But yeah, let's yeah. go through this. <laughs> uh, they're anti-nutrients found in plants. They're high in spinach, beets, Swiss chard, rhubarb. Can be produced by yeast, fungus, and mold. And again, when you've got all of this inflammation going on, your body's just a friendly place for that to happen. Mm -hmm. Uh, Small quantities are made by some human metabolism. Uh, Some of the mineral chelators are calcium, magnesium, zinc, and iron. Uh, I'm not gonna read this list, but here's all the conditions can be associated with the overabsorption. Well, uh, the people with IC, they have many, many of these other symptoms. I see PCOS, fibroids, endometriosis, fibromyalgia, uh, kidney stones, thyroid dysfunction, diverticulitis, ear crystals, vertigo, osteopenia. I mean, vulvodynia. Look at this, people. You guys see this? Wow. Yeah. Those are some of the conditions associated with the overabsorption of oxalates. Um, and again, I'm not going to read this. Um, uh, somebody maybe just wants to pause and read this. They they can, uh, unless you have any comments on any of these. Well, you know, it, it's it's. I think what people have to understand is when you look at that first slide that he had with the little crystals. These crystals are depositing not only in your organs, which the main place they excrete is the bladder. That's one of the reasons why you feel it when it's coming out. I mean, when I when it's coming out of me, it feels like glass. I always used to say, I feel like I'm peeing glass. That's what it feels like, and they really are. That's what you really are doing. But even to make it even worse, it can actually damage your mitochondria. And that's where everything goes downhill at that point, because if you're not producing ATP, well, your cells need ATP, your tissues need ATP, your organs need them. And finally, the organism needs them, you know, in that hierarchy. So, I mean, they're very, very damaging. And and I think we're finally coming around to truly understand how bad they really are. Absolutely. Uh, Just the last line. Excess oxalate can lead to oxidative damage and depletion of glutathione and NADPH. And anyone who's listened to me speak knows that I'm a huge fan of NADPH because this is what takes the oxidized glutathione back to the reduced, what helps you make your uh, your nitric oxide. Uh, the NADH is at the top of the electron transport chain. Uh, very, very important to have enough NADPH. My glutathione levels were tanked and I will never forget the first time I got an IV of glutathione, I felt like I was on cloud nine. It was the best thing ever. Yep. But sometimes if we don't recycle the glutathione, if you keep taking, it can actually make you worse. Yes. And uh, here's a slide that shows that it uh, triggers the activation of NLRP3 inflammasome uh, that again uh, is inflammatory. And uh, just bad news that was a very important finding when they identified that the nlrp3 inflammasome activation it just kind of sealed it you know like this is just tells you how bad the oxalates are absolutely um, a healthy gut contains oxalobacter formagen formagens i'm probably not saying that right i call them oxac uh, there you go <laughs> there you go uh, they degrade uh in a non-leaky human gut oxalates are degraded by this um, enzyme. This prevents the molecules from traveling to the large intestine and being absorbed by body tissues. Now, once again, non-leaky human gut. If anybody thinks about what I spoke about with the mold, the genetics, that's what creates the conditions for the leaky gut because there is a relationship between gut damage and that INOS being upregulated. So I think we've sort of like plotted out how this occurs. You know, because some people do a smoothie every day with spinach and kale and they're fine. And other people, the oxalates just about, uh, you know, wreck them. Um, If in a leaky gut or when this uh, is diminished by antibiotics, 
The oxalates escape into the bloodstream, damage body tissues, glands, the organs, and the, and the brain. Um, now, here's a couple genetic predispositions. GRHPR, SPP1, HOGA1, and AGXT. Now, a lot of times people say, well, based on my genetics, do I have oxalates? There's no way to know. Uh, the oxalates, uh, do you, uh, Dr. Mandy, do you use the, uh, the Great Plains uh, oat test? I do, and I use the Genova also, and they both have the same oxalate markers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so these are predispositions, key word there, predispositions. Yes. So there's no way the genetic test is going to tell you whether you have oxalates. Exactly. Genes are not your destiny, everybody. What was that again? Genes okay. are not your destiny. They're not. But if someone has oxalates, these might be some of the ones to look at to see if supporting them might be helpful. I have SPP1 polymorphism. Mm, gotcha. And then here's a, uh, a note test that shows the oxalic uh, mm -hmm. being high. Now, here is... Uh, a case study. I thought we'd wrap up with this. Uh, this is a lady by the name of Wendy, soaring histamine, gut pain and anxiety. And look what Wendy has. HFE H63, overabsorption of iron, one. Double mutation on KEEP1, mutations on HMOX. NERF2, this is the enzyme that takes oxidized glutathione back to reduced. No wonder this poor woman has soaring histamine. And then IL-10, we didn't talk about that one, but that will calm down some of the inflammation and some mutations there as well. Oh, was that an up regulation or down? That was a down regulation, correct? Those the IL-10? Yeah. Yeah, the IL-10 is a down regulation. Um, before you go to the next slide, uh, could you explain to them the HFE with the iron absorption? Because um, I'm not sure if they understand why iron absorption is so inflammatory. Oh, sure. The, um, obviously, life doesn't exist without iron. I mean, we use it to make our red blood cells, to carry our oxygen. So without iron, life wouldn't exist. But iron has to be carried around very carefully uh, by things like ceruloplasm. And if we just have iron floating around, it's very inflammatory. That's why things rust. And uh, this HFE gene, when it's a 2 this is, a, this is a very serious condition where the person has to do phlebotomy sometimes monthly to get the iron out uh, because that excess iron is related to damaging the pancreas. It's associated with uh, dementia. And I, I know we went through a lot very quickly, but if you remember at the top of that list, iron in excess will stimulate tumor necrosis factor and begin that whole pathway coming down through. And excess iron will also stimulate the INOS enzyme to make excessive inducible nitric oxide. So uh, without iron, life doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Too much unregulated, incredibly, incredibly uh, inflammatory. Balance. Yeah. Um, and then also GSR. You know, sometimes people, uh, let's see if I can pull a, let's just see if I can pull something over here. I can, we'll pull this right over here. Okay. So here is um, glutathione. Reduced glutathione means that it's ready to go. It's got a spare electron on it. Through glutathione conjugation, we take out toxins. After we do that, the glutathione becomes oxidized, meaning it's lost its electron. We then need the GSR enzyme and NADPH, and look at this, controlled by NERF2 and KEEP1, to take this oxidized glutathione, recycle it back to the reduced, because if we don't do that, it will turn into superoxide uh -huh. and peroxynitrite. Got it. So that's why some people take glutathione and they feel like a million bucks and others are like, I think you're trying to kill me. Yes, I've uh, heard that too. Yeah. So I, in my opinion, before anybody does, now if you do a little liposomal, a couple of days a week won't make any difference. But um, if somebody does intravenous in a large amount regularly, I think they really ought to know where they have this weakness here. So my SNPs are on the GSTs. I have a bunch on the GSTs. Yeah. So I have trouble conjugating. Yes. That's how you do what's called glutathione conjugation to take yep. out toxins. Yeah. But if you've got a lot of weakness in keep or strength in keep one, weakness in nerve two, doesn't matter whether you have SNPs here or not, it'll be impacted. 
Yes, that's why I said it's a superstar. <laughs> uh -huh, yeah. And uh, interestingly, molar mycotoxins will inhibit the NAC and, and N-acetylcysteine, which is, you know, sometimes people just uh, think that's another superstar. But if you if you don't take that cysteine down into glutathione, and it can actually go down transulfuration and make sulfites and be inflammatory. So yeah, I also heard, was listening in the lecture today that um, N-acetylcysteine um, is contradicted if somebody has um, ulcers. Yes. On the gastrointestinal tract. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and sometimes people are taking too much of things that they read about, and they may be actually hurting them. Yeah. Sometimes I say in our coaching, sometimes I think we help people by taking them off things. Yeah. Because one of the the biggest fallacies is. Uh, People learn they have MTHFR, C677, and it's like, oh, I need methylfolate. And if you don't have enough riboflavin or you don't have enough NADPH, you can feel great for about a week to 10 days and then crash. So just because you have MTHFR doesn't mean it's a good idea to take methylfolate. Yes. So here was this young lady's ability to clear histamine. Uh, you can see here, homozygous on MAOA, homozygous MAOB heterozygous on UGT1A4, mm. uh, so could not clear histamine. Guys who are listening, understand when he says homozygous, heterozygous, homozygous means two copies from um, this, you know, from each parent. Heterozygous is to get a separate allele from, which is the, you know, the variation, so the two different letters. Um, and then when you have the homozygous, generally it's a, a stronger expression. It can be arranged from anywhere from 50 to 70% reduction in function, or if it's a gain of function, then it would be an upregulation. Yes. But the homozygous is, is more severe than a heterozygous. Thank you for explaining that. I should have mentioned that earlier. That's okay. And then here is the, um, the NOS enzyme that's gain of function. So you can see how this person has gut pain, anxiety, and probably in the very near future would be on the path to oxalates if we mm -hmm. didn't, uh, didn't intervene. Um, finally, the uh, Here's the, the latest thing we did with uh, Dr. Jill, genetics of platelet activation, because I am being very intrigued by, uh, by platelet activation, because I believe it's more common than we realize, then creates the, uh, the RANTES, SCD40L, TNF, and VEGF, but we won't get into today, but all of those are, are very pro-inflammatory. Uh, last slide here, if there's any uh, health professionals who are watching this and they would like to do the uh, genetic testing that we're talking about. Uh, there's the website, functionalgenomicanalysis.com. Uh, Yvonne Lucchese is the executive director. And uh, we have lots of supplements that help with this. And if you're a health professional, uh, freedomtoformulate.com. So if you're a person dealing with IC and uh, please don't try to sign up because we're gonna ask you for your, your credentials and everything. But if there's any doctors listening here, uh, feel free to, uh, to check us out and do a uh, a free trial. Thank you, Bob. Yes, I'm going to be ha actually have a meeting to sign up with the Freedom to Formulate soon. And your course is on my list this summer. I'm excited to dive into that. So if have health professionals listening, make sure you sign up for the course too. Yes. <laughs> but I've been, I've been going on your webinars. Your webinars have been very helpful. So thank you for all that education. Yes. yes. So I think we are really cracking the code here uh, as to the pathways that's, uh, that's occurring. And, uh, you know, Dr. Andy, it might be a bad, not bad idea sometime to, uh, to if we have some people in your software that, uh, that have severe IC, maybe take a peek and see if there's some patterns that align with this. But uh, I think we'd uh, likely find that to be true. Oh, I'm totally going to be doing that. This is my go-to test now for um, everyone who walks in through the door. I just feel like it's you're missing a whole lot of information if you don't run this test because this can really shortchange the healing process. I mean, people come to me, they want less pain. This is going to give you that path to get there faster because you're going to know exactly what's going on inside your body, especially when you pair it up with something like Nutraval or organic acid, because then you can see if the genes are being expressed or not. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, a good example is sometimes I'll see people that they have very little problem in their histamine degradation, but they've got a huge histamine problem because they're overproducing. Then you have some people who don't overproduce, but everything that can break it down is in trouble. So it's important to know what to do. Or if you don't have uh, enough uh, DAO, you've got to go easy on the histamine foods. Um, or the histamine might be because the mast cells are overactivated uh, or could come from the excessive iron. Uh, there's just so many ways. And I believe that's why we've got to get away from protocols. 
And uh, we have to look at people individually. Correct. Personalized care. Absolutely. Because say, well, you know, what do we do for IC? Well, it all depends. It all depends where the, the triggers are uh, are coming from. So I have to say that all the time because I always get inquiries like that. What can I do for my IC? What can I do for my IC? And I don't know because I don't know anything about you. <laughs> So, well, thank you so much. This was really great. And I hope those listening today have, got, have gotten something. I know it was, for some of you, it was maybe a lot over your head, but what I would recommend is go back and rewatch it, slow it down, pause it. You don't have to understand all the pathways. Honestly, that's my job. That's my job. My job is to understand the pathways. All you have to understand is that there is a reason why this is happening to you. And we have ways to look inside. And we have, like you said, what was that phrase you said? For every negative thing, there's always a positive. Absolutely. Yeah. As I tell everybody, there's no bad news here. There you go. Um, uh, we don't we don't drop any bombs on you. So if, if you see um, Dr. Mandy for this, uh, she won't tell you, oh, it looks like you're going to get to this disease. So I tell people the because uh, everything we find we can compensate for. Thank now, you. On, on the other hand, uh, for some of these things, I tell people we have good news and bad news. The good news is you can compensate. The bad news is you can compensate. So. <laughs> It's so all we, how you look at it, right? Perspective. Yeah, we can't fix the genes. We can't, you know, every once in a while somebody says, well, can I go back later and see if the genes are fixed? It's like, no, no, they're, they are what they are. Yeah. But you can compensate. And you don't always have to compensate as strongly over time. But, you know, there's a couple times I'll tell people like, you know, DAO is your lifetime buddy. Because uh, that's just the hand you were dealt. Things that slow down the absorption of iron. Lifetime buddy. Right. And as long as people are okay with that, they know it's like, well, as long as I do that, I'll, I'll be all right. Yeah, that's the case with everything. I mean, I always use an example with weight loss. You know, if somebody has or gain, gains weight and they go on a diet and exercise plan and they lose weight, well, they can't just stop because they'll gain weight again. So it's the same thing. I think sometimes people have a hard time hearing, this is forever. I know that's hard. This is forever. But remember that analogy it just gave you, you know, this is just a modification. It's not that bad. So. Exactly. Well, thank you so much. And I am really looking forward to learning more from you. Okay. We'll be there for you. Okay. Thanks. Take care.